Okay. Uh, well, welcome everybody. Thank you all for coming to this program uh, hosted by the Shrewsbury Public Library. Um, I recognize a lot of a lot of names in the uh, the attendees list, so I know a lot of you are coming from quite a distance uh, than uh, from Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. So, so welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think I'm just going to turn it right over to our, our panelists uh, to introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about your uh, your career in game journalism. Um, I don't know who wants to go first. I could go first. Okay, great. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nicole Carpenter. Um, I'm also from Massachusetts, but currently in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and I am a senior reporter at Polygon. I have been here for over a year now. Um, and before that, I was primarily a freelance writer. Um, I focused mostly on uh, reporting in the video game industry, but I have also written about food and you know, internet culture and um, fashion, and you name it, I have probably written about it at one point, but the majority of my career has been in video game, in, uh, in covering video games. Um, I guess I have been in the industry for about, uh, or, a, or a journalist for about four-ish years, um, that's both freelance and, and at Polygon. So I, 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 would, I would call myself relative new, you know, new-ish, but yeah, that's my deal. Um, I studied uh, English in college and before I started freelancing, I worked in publishing for uh, technical manuals. So I was a copy editor on technical manuals and it was very boring. So this is a very uh, welcome career change. That's it. <laughs> cool, well, thank, thank you, thank you. Hello, my name is Kat Bailey. I'm a senior editor at IGN. I've been in the games industry for about 12 years now. I'm also a podcast host. I host a show called Acts of the Blood God. It's about RPGs. I got my start freelancing for oneup.com and a variety of other publications. And then I joined Jeremy Parrish over at US Gamer. And then I became editor in chief of US Gamer in 2017. Before I got into the games industry, I lived in Japan for three years where I was an English teacher and then I was a curriculum development specialist. And it actually wasn't that bad ultimately, but I think I prefer my job in the games industry. Uh, I'll go. Uh, hello, I'm Allegra Frank. I'm currently a senior editor at Slate, but I started my career in both journalism and video game journalism specifically at Polygon. So shout out to Nicole. Although sadly our uh, paths did not cross. I left Polygon right before Nicole started. Um, I joined Polygon in 2015 as a reporter and I was there until 2019, I think, 2018. Um, and I left as a deputy news editor and then I moved over to Vox um, where I shifted focus away from video games um, to focus more on music and animation, movies, other aspects of internet culture, but video games remain a large part of my beat. So I continue to cover all of those things now that I'm over at Slate, where I've been since this past January. All right, and finally, I am Jeremy Parrish and I am not actually a games journalist anymore. <laughs> I've actually been out of uh, games journalism longer than Nicole has been in it. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, I guess you could call me retired, sort of. Um, currently, I co host a podcast about classic games. I run a YouTube channel where I post a weekly video about video game history. Um, and those are independent. But then at the same time, my day job is working at Limited Run Games. So I'm in the games publishing side of things now. Uh, but before that, up until 2017, uh, from 2003 to 2017, I was uh, at, in, you know, in the press, in the, the trenches, uh, starting at oneup.com back before it even had a name and before it had launched, all the way until they took it out behind the woodshed and put a bull in its head. 
Um, then I jumped briefly over to IGN and was kind of put into the wrong position there. It just wasn't a, a spot for me. It was not really journalism. It was more mar uh, like marketing. And I said, ah, I don't know about that. So then I uh, happened to get an opportunity to help launch US Gamer and did that until I handed the reins over to Kat and uh, kind of went my own way with podcasting and video game history. But in addition to those publications, I've also written for, you know, a dozen websites and magazines from Electronic Gaming Monthly and PlayStation Magazine or PlayStation Monthly, whatever it was, official PlayStation Magazine, yes, to Polygon, uh, Vice, uh, you know, Waypoint, a bunch of other sites. Um, so I've, I've kind of been all over the place, but it's not the career I had expected. I did uh, work with my university newspaper in college, but I actually thought I was going to be a graphic designer. And uh, so I studied art and art history uh, a lot in college and then just kind of uh, ended up here through happenstance. It was just, you know, a thing that interested me. I had a website, a blog before the word blog existed. Uh, didn't We didn't really know what to call these websites back then, but that just kind of led me through different paths, different routes into the games press when uh, Ziff Davis was looking to get online and uh, start a website. And that's how I kind of ended up in San Francisco at 1UP and uh, you know, for 15 years in, in the games press. Well, cool. Well, thank you all for uh, for introducing yourselves. I realized I didn't introduce myself. I'm the assistant director at the Shrewsbury Public Library. I'm Mike Zeller. Um, so we're going to open it up to questions, although I did just make an interesting discovery that the, the chat feature seems to have, uh, have vanished. So um, what I'm going to do instead, uh, if anybody uh, wants to ask a question, um, since it's all muted, uh, just use the, um, one of the little reactions, just do a thumbs up and I will unmute you so you can, you can ask your question. Oh, the hands up. That's even better. All right. Uh... Hey, Mike, it's Riona. Hey, Riona. And D&D &D pal. Um, I'm not a plant at all. No, uh, there is a, yes, a hand raising and lowering option, but my question is, the classic, how did you first get into game journalism? Well, got I can, oh, go ahead, go ahead uh -oh. Jeremy. <laughs> oh my gosh, crosstalk, how horrifying. <laughs> um, I got into games journalism because uh, I was a, I went, I'm sorry. I studied journalism in school. And when I was finished, uh, the natural question was, okay, what am I gonna do with this fancy new degree? I had been, you know, an avid reader of game magazines and game websites for most of my life. And I enjoy video games quite a bit. And so I said to myself, hey, maybe I should join video games. Or like maybe I should be a video game journalist. This, this can be a thing. And I literally Googled, how do you become a video game journalist? And I saw a blog <laughs> from Dan Shu, who was, uh, I believe, the editor in chief of 1UP at that time. And he had a, a list of items on how to become a game journalist. This was 2006 and he suggested starting a blog, uh, preferably at oneup.com, their website. And so I did, and I quickly found a really nice community over there. Uh, several journalists who are still in the games industry now uh, actually got their start as one of community members, uh, such as Jeff Grubb over at um, GameSpeed. And we, we've all been kind of tight knit over the years. And uh, one up had a process that where they were trying to deliberately find people within the community to join up. And so somebody approached me and asked if I would like to write news on a freelance basis uh, for one up. And that was how I started started moving into the actual business of games journalism. And once I had my in, I moved over to San Francisco and one up felt bad for me and gave me a lot of work. <laughs> and so <laughs> I was able to make it work ultimately. Uh, so my, my experience goes way back to the very early days of the World Wide Web, back when that was still a young and strange thing and people were just launching video games websites and saying, can you actually make a career out of doing this? And so, uh, you know, around the time the N64 launched in 1996, I started reading this site called N64.com, which eventually became IGN. And, um, you know, I, you know, was reading all their sites, getting this daily drip of news every evening and said, you know, I could 
launch a website of, of my own. So I did, and it was terrible. But at the same time, you know, I started getting into the forums for different websites and uh, got involved with uh, one forum where I posted a lot. Uh, it was very, you know, RPG related right in the wake of Final Fantasy VII launching. And so, um, you know, that just kind of snowballed and the people there kind of started up their own website and said, hey, this guy in the forum does some cool art and stuff. We should have him do some art with us. So I kind of became attached to a site that launched called the Gaming Intelligence Agency. And, you know, over time, I just kind of kept in touch with those folks and uh, was kind of in and out of their circles. And as it turns out, that when, uh, like I said, Ziff Davis wanted to launch a website for its gaming space, it only had magazines at that point. Uh, one of the folks from the GIA, Nick Maragos, uh, said, hey, I know you're looking for work and we are looking for a graphic designer. Would you be willing to relocate to San Francisco? And I was like, uh, yeah, obviously. So I you know, applied and they liked my chops and said, you've got the job. Like uh, it was you know, just one of those things that just kind of fell together. But um, it, it really is kind of about you know, who you know and uh, not just you know, having connections, but also I think getting out there, putting your name out there and, you know, showing your work, you know, and making people realize, hey, this is a, a person whose contributions could have value. I think that's something that still, you know, can be applied even today, and not just something back in the dim and distant dawn of the internet. Whoever wants to go next. Go okay, okay. I was I was giving a, a legger and a chance to go, but um, I, I won our game both, of chicken. <laughs> yes, I think we were both doing that to each other. Um, I, I could go next though. Um, Everybody's very very polite. Very <laughs> I <laughs> I um, went to college relatively later in life, around when I was around twenty six, and that was in two thousand. 15, so they were just starting to do um, digital culture classes at the university that I went to. Um, and I had been previously uh, studying something like, um, I'd been studying English and then on a professional writing track. But then when I took this digital culture class, my teacher was like, you know, you can, you can like, you can make a living about writing things about things that you like, that you like. And I had been someone who, who had been, uh, you know, I read video game websites, I played video games. So I thought, you know, I could cover the video game industry. So and that was the first time I realized, like, real, I re really realized like, Hey, yeah, like people are writing that stuff I'm reading on the internet. Um, and went from there. Uh, of course, I didn't immediately go into that after college. I went into publishing, but on my breaks, like lunch break, and when I was supposed to be doing other stuff, sometimes I would be freelancing. Um, I started, and I and it kind of. Um, I, I didn't know anybody. Um, I didn't know anybody in the video game industry. I didn't know where to get a start, um, but I had seen on Twitter that IGN was looking for freelance writers for their news team and I applied. Um, and because at college I had studied digital culture with my teacher encouraging me to write about stuff that I liked, video games. I had built up sort of a small like blog portfolio of college writing. And so I applied uh, with that and they liked it. And from there, I kind of, um, one thing they don't teach you at, at school, even on a journalism track was how to pitch. Um, and so I pitched a lot, messed up a lot, but learned a lot in the process. And I think started to develop a unique beat. And that's where, you know, people started to see, oh, like, hey, okay, all right, we'll take her stuff. But it was a lot of uh, a lot of pitching, a lot of rejections, more than I could count um, on for the rest of my life. Uh, but some people said yes, and that's, that's how I got to this job now. <laughs> um, I feel like I have a fairly linear and kind of privileged storyline <laughs> into getting into games journalism, um, being that it was my very first job outside out after college. Um, so yeah, I mean, the classic, I always played video games story applies to me too. You know, I read a lot of gaming magazines and news sites like IGN and Kotaku 
and I went on forums a ton, although I never posted, I was always very shy and more a, a reader than a participant. Um, so I, I just ingested everything related to video games, both like news and criticism wise, as well as the games themselves. And at the same time, I've always loved writing. I used to really like writing more short stories and fiction as a kid. And then when I got into high school, I really found a love of journalism um, and especially arts and entertainment journalism because those were the things I were, was most interested in. Um, and then when I went to college, I was still interested in pursuing journalism, but I mostly stuck with my original love of writing fiction and took a lot of creative writing classes and ended up studying film. So I, I was writing a lot about film. I studied like film theory as opposed to actually the practical side of it. Um, so yeah, I sort of shifted more in that direction and away from journalism a bit and thought I'd try and get into the film industry, but that's incredibly hard. <laughs> uh, so after I graduated, nothing was really panning out in terms of you know jobs in film production assistant jobs or whatnot. Um, so I felt kind of lost and stuck, but you know, I, I remembered my love of writing and journalism. So I did sort of poke around at any potential open positions in those areas, although those are also very hard to come by. But one day as I was perusing like every single possible open position on the internet, I saw that Polygon, which was a site I read, because I'm still obsessed with games in all forms and ways, um, was hiring for an entry level reporter. And I really didn't think I would get that kind of job because you know, I was so young and green and didn't really have any clips and didn't have like the strongest journalism background I felt to get an actual professional job. So I mostly applied thinking, oh, well, if I got even an interview, I could at least brag I met XYZ people from Polygon. Um, and I did get an interview and I did get to brag about meeting those people. And then eventually those people hired me and became my bosses. So yeah, it was right the September after I graduated college, I landed at Polygon. So yeah, I mean, obviously there, there was some difficulty there in just sort of determining what I wanted to do in the first place, but I never, you know, I always saw myself as a writer and I loved writing about the things that were interesting to me. And of course, games are a huge, huge portion of my interests, but I never was like, I want to write about video games. Like, even though I idolized a lot of games journalists growing up, I was like, it would be cool to meet this person, but I don't see myself being like this person. But then when I ended up getting to be like those people, like those reporters, I read a lot when I was growing up, I was like, okay, actually this job rules. I get to go to E3 and that's actually really awesome because I never thought I would get to do that. So here, here I am. Very cool, very cool. Lots of uh, diff different but similar answers. Um, so if anybody else, if you wanna do the little hand raise thing or thumbs up or indicate if you've got a question, um, I've also got some questions in case people are feeling shy. Uh, oh, Annie has a question. Hi, um, I was wondering um, when you write a piece, what do you hope your readers' takeaways will be? I think um, for me, it depends on the kind of piece that I'm writing. Uh, if I'm doing uh, a reported piece, um, like something, I recently wrote a story about psychologists and therapists who stream on Twitch, um, which I found was a very complicated subject and a lot of people had a lot of different thoughts on it. But what I wanted the people to take away from that was just sort of like the truth of the matter and like the, the story, like understanding the story and um, being able to like come to their own decisions about it, I guess, um, you know, having all, all the information themselves and, uh, you know, presenting it in a way that's accessible and um, truthful and, uh, you know, um, what's the word? Ethical, um, but yes, 
you know, something like that, like in a way that they can trust and not feel, yeah, I don't know. That's what, that's the line I was going down. But um, if I'm writing like a news or, or like kind of, I also write a lot of like short kind of impressions piece and, you know, really fun stuff. So that's the sort of thing that you want people to, to get joy from reading or to like laugh or maybe um, learn something or, you know, it, for me, it really varies by the piece and I'm excited to hear what everyone else had to say because I just like put on muted myself and just started saying words without thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded, it sounded very, uh, very coherent. It flowed in a sense, so. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Um, as someone, oh, sorry, Jeremy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> as someone who now works primarily as an editor, I work a lot with writers on what I want them to, you know, try and morph their ultimate takeaway into. Like, I talk a lot with them about, okay, what is the ultimate intention with this piece? What is the question that we are asking and the answer we are providing? So I, it's not to say I think of all journalism as a service, but it's more so that my approach to the, the way I write is to be the one to provide that insightful, analytical, and sometimes surprising or unique answer to a question they definitely are asking or didn't know that they had. Um, I think that's just a really defining principle of journalism writ large, but I found it, you know, applicable to all the different forms of journalism I've done. Um, as I mentioned, when I was at Polygon, I was the deputy news editor, which actually was Nicole's role when she came on. So we're, we're like little kindred spirits right there. Um, we're the same person is what I'm saying, but uh, I was very much about news, which is much more straightforward than like criticism, but it's always the same principle of what is the question and what is the answer that we are giving in this case in an objective and straightforward news sense or with criticism and analysis, it's what is the reported takeaway that you are offering to the, the reader to some sort of larger inquiry into a cultural topic that they may have been posing or that we are posing to them. All right. Um, I, I think my answer is somewhat similar to Nicole's in that it really does depend on the kind of piece uh, I, I write. Uh, at this point, you know, um, I, I'm kind of more looking back at, at what I did in the press and the pieces that I always enjoyed the most were usually features or, or retrospectives, uh, usually built around interviews uh, and reviews. And with both of those, I think my ultimate goal was for the reader to take away something new whether that was developer insights, you know, the history of, of a game they had never heard about or never thought was very interesting, or just, you know, uh, some, some sort of uh, insight into what makes a developer tick or how the game design process works. Uh, that, that was always, you know, something I, I, I always tried to bring into my work so that people could go away thinking, oh, I've, you know, I've had a valuable experience here. Like this was, this was useful to me. I learned something. Or with, with reviews, not necessarily to agree that I'm right, but you know, maybe to be challenged or to consider an angle that they hadn't thought of before or see things in a in a unique way. Um, so, you know, I always saw my role in in the press as being one of you know many voices. I wanted to be a perspective, not the the absolute word of anything but just another angle for people to consider and you know to complement the the other work that my peers and, and colleagues were putting out and so i felt like you know the best thing i could do was just add to the variety of opinions and information that was out there so that's that i guess that's really what i was primarily interested in doing and to add to jeremy what jeremy was saying i, I think that whether you're writing news or you're writing a piece of criticism, there's value in actually adding to the conversation because I think a lot of the articles out there are mostly just new, just noise. 
And a lot of them are just there to get people to click on the article and then just get the information out as fast as possible. <clears throat> but when you can actually add to the conversation in some meaningful way, then you're actually doing a service for people, um, especially in news. Like one of the things I'm always kind of shooting for is to be timely, relevant, and informative. And if you can hit those three things, probably got a worthwhile news story. <laughs> Unfortunately, a, a lot of news stories are out there are timely, but they aren't really informative, I think. So um, as for actual criticism, I think that there are a lot of people out there who are really articulate and very good at taking an argument or touching on a broader cultural issue in their criticism and contextualizing it with their reviews. Uh, personally, often when I'm uh, approaching a review, I'm going for more of an experiential kind of thing. I'm trying to paint a picture for my audience so that they have a really clear idea of what they are looking at, what they are experiencing, and what is going on in my head. In, my, in a way, I'm having a conversation with them. I often say that when I'm having a review, I try to imagine myself sitting down at a coffee shop and just talking to my audience, having a back and forth, only it's just me monologuing, I guess, but you see what I'm saying. But those are, those are some broad thoughts on how I approach my work. I wanted to add on to that with regard to reviews. Um, something that you reminded me of is, I think that a lot of people often think about reviews and approach it as, will I like this game? Um, when it maybe should be, when um, if, you know, the reader, will the reader like this game? But I like to approach the review as did I, did, you know, about my feelings on the game um, and from like, and go at it from a very specific angle. Um, so, you know, my, if I'm writing a review, it's not necessarily something, if someone who is very different from me, someone who is into different styles of video games, has different experience level, they're not going to learn from the review, from my review, whether or not they're going to like the game. But people who um, who find similarities in their interests or in their play styles or their tastes, um, kind of that's sort of th they'll get a better picture, I think, about. Um, it's about, you know, the experience of the game. And uh, if that makes sense at all, does that make sense? Yeah, okay. It makes total um, sense, honestly. And I think one of the problems that I find a lot in the games industry, and I don't think I'm breaking any new ground by saying it, but even now in 2021, people still have, a, a lot of people still have a very mechanical approach to reviewing video games where they're saying, I am breaking down all of the technical aspects of this game. And my ultimate goal is to do a consumer report to help you understand whether or not you should buy this game. And I think it frankly makes for some very boring criticism and ultimately isn't that helpful because what they're actually writing is marketing copy. So if you sit down and you actually write in your own voice, and you are really putting yourself into that review. And as I was already saying, painting is a picture and then going in and actually like discussing what all of that picture means and being able to contextualize it for the audience, then maybe you're being more helpful than just kind of regurgitating talking points from the back of the box. I will say that I find that games journalism, journalism today, even though it's a really tough space from a business perspective compared to when I started when you know it was pretty much gated to professionals uh, it was largely focused on magazines with huge influxes of ad buy dollars um, it was just a very different kind of place than it is now where it's much more democratized but I think there's so much more opportunity and so much more freedom for writers now to bring those perspectives to say like what's the cultural impact of this game you know to just you know, to throw out an example, I saw links. I haven't had a chance to read the article yet, uh, but I saw links, you know, over the past day or two, for people praising a review of the Mass Effect trilogy remaster that basically says, like, "Hey, this, you know, this kind of when you take this in the context of you know modern day police issues, 
like this 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 game really lands differently like i just can't imagine someone writing that review in 2004 2005 like there would there would have been no place for it that would never have flown in a magazine and websites at the time were still very much kind of hemmed in by by games journalism boundaries and and the rules and sort of the you know to a high degree what what advertisers would accept um that was always kind of hovering over you know in the back of everyone's minds maybe not necessarily at the writer level but definitely at the editor level the publisher level um and you know there's st certainly still some of that around uh but there are more outlets and there are more opportunities for people to really say something significant and to say you know video games aren't just a fun goofy hobby they they can have substance they can have meaning and we can explore these things and what they mean to us and how they fit into the broader cultural context and you know that's that's really just it's been fantastic to watch this medium evolve over the past 20 25 years and become something so much more mature and so much more meaningful yeah that's that's a really excellent point um we will take more audience questions, but actually that, that leads into a, a question that I wanted to ask, um, which is, uh, you kind of just answered it, Jeremy, but I'm, I'm curious what the others, if you think, uh, like what's been the biggest shift in the game industry, uh, the game journalism industry, since you started writing about games? Um, when I started, I, and again, I have, a shorter lifespan of experience here. So I'm curious to hear from people like Jeremy and Kat. But when I started, I was writing news and the expectation was to like pretty much write up like any press release. Like I was writing nine stories a day and by stories, I mean like news posts, um, like pretty much every single day I was writing at least nine stories, at least, um, you know, if it was like a big, live event where they were announcing a bunch of new game updates or new game releases. Um, I would sometimes write nine stories within an hour. Um, E3, I would write like 20 stories a day because we would just be writing every single piece of news um, as if Twitter didn't exist, right? Like the mentality in 2015 up to, you know, the mentality in 2015 versus now or 2019 when I left Polygon changed so much because we started to realize people are getting their news morsels and interacting with games and studios through social media and the, the games and the producers and creators themselves. We aren't the first point of you know, contact for them. So there isn't that same need to be the ones regurgitating press releases. So I saw us move away from trying to be completely comprehensive in that sense of being the like the paper of record, having every single piece of news developments in a game's life cycle on our website and instead moving to more unique takes and reported angles, just really shifting toward, okay, what can we provide to the readers that they aren't going to just easily and immediately get from the creators themselves or the game studios themselves. And I think that's a really healthy change that the games journalism industry has made. Speaking um, for myself, uh, when I joined the games industry, uh, you know, 10 years ago, whatever, it was a lot, um, for lack of a better term, uh, broier. Um, just the conversation in the newsroom tended to tended to go much more toward, a, it was almost like a frat house in many ways. And I still have a lot of friends from that period. And there was like that real kind of energy to it. And there weren't, there were women in the games, uh, the games press, but it, it was very tough and frequently, um, you had to work extremely hard to be taken seriously. And you, and that's still quite true today. Like, I don't think that it's, I, I think that the kind of approach or the way that women are treated in the games press has certainly shifted in a lot of ways, but it's still very challenging in many ways. But um, I think that 
starting around 2013, 2014, I perceived a shift where there were many more uh, young women coming into the games press and being able to actually move up in rank, which was quite hard. Um, over at IGN, I work under uh, Tina, who is our editor in chief, and I work alongside Rebecca Valentine, who's an amazing uh, reporter. And there are a lot of uh, very cool women just in that organization, which was kind of like not as much the case 10 years ago. And so I perceive that as a positive, even if we have a lot of work to do in terms of how toxic the audience is and how toxic the conversation can be around women in the games press. Yeah, I've, I've said before and not really as a joke that the best contribution I ever made to games journalism was stepping aside and saying, hey, you need to make Cat Bailey the editor in chief of US Gamer. <laughs> um, you know, just saying like, there, there's lots of people like me out there. Uh, what about a different voice? Um, and you know, you you did awesome work as as EIC. So I feel like I can I can say you know I was right. Um, but but you're absolutely right about the the broy attitude of uh, the games press. And you know, even though I'm a straight white dude, I still felt like an outsider for a lot of my career. You know, in the in the press with the magazines and the the websites just because that's not really my approach to things. And I never really quite got in with the kind of the party scene and the bar hopping scene and so forth. So, you know, I had to kind of make my, my mark, not by, you know, being one of the cool guys who hangs out and you go drinking with, but just like being the guy who has his head down and keeps working and, you know, turns in content on a regular basis and it's good, um, which is fine. That's, you know, that's preferential for me, but there's definitely a different attitude in, in the games press these days. I'm sure there are still publications that are very bro -y, but I feel like those have become kind of isolated out on their own. And most people don't want, really want to associate with them. Whereas it was just, it was, you know, that was the, the standard that was just kind of the default for a long time. And I, I look back at, you know, some of our early podcasts and videos where just the language people used in the office. Like I picked up some of those things and used language where I'm like, I look back at it and I'm like, wow, I, I'm so embarrassed that I, you know, was, was saying stuff like that, but it's just, it was just the culture and it was hard not to just pick it up and, you know, communicate with people in those, in those ways. And I'm glad that, you know, these days people call you out for things like that and they'll, they'll hold your feet over the fire and that's good. That's valuable. It forces people to really stop and, you know, either consider other people's thoughts and perspectives and say, oh, you know, it's not just me out there or else, you know, they'll buckle down and say, no, it's my way and the only way. And they'll kind of go off and do their own thing. And yeah, that's never good. But, you know, at least there is kind of that almost like a centrifuge now that, that really takes out a lot of those toxic elements and uh, has definitely pushed them aside and they're no longer, you know, just kind of the default standard, the de facto standard, and that's great. Yeah, um, I guess one last thing to add was that I, I, you know, I think that both journalism and the video game industry are held back by a, by a lack of diversity and the really cool shift that I have seen recently is that, at least in journalism, is that, um, publications are unionizing, um, writers are unionizing. And so um, that work, you know, this isn't, I don't think this is necessarily a games journalist trend that this is happening, but um, when workers unionize, they're able to push for that meaningful change and feel safer doing so. And that has been really cool to see. I never thought that I would be having a job uh, in the journal, in the as a journalist that was unionized, so it was really, really cool to come to Vox and have that be the case. It doesn't fix all the problems, but it is a step in the. It is a step towards that and giving workers power to do that. Cool. Okay, uh, I'm going to take a question from actually one of our old talking time buddies, Matt uh, Matt Keeley. Hey, Mike. Um, thank you for organizing this. Um, great panel. 
Um, actually, I had a question about something that Jeremy mentioned about the sort of, you know, really enjoying the kind of defund the space police um, reviews of Mass Effect. And I'd like to know what you think you'd like to see more of in games criticism and games journalism. I'd like to see um, more people sort of challenging the the mainstream norm um, in games journalism. So the example of like applying things like ACAB to Mass Effect, and I read an interesting piece about LA Noir today that also kind of discussed from a more contemporary lens, the like portrayal of police characters. Um, Something that's really, I don't know, turned me off of games journalism and part of why I left Polygon in the first place as I, part of my journey was trying to rediscover a love for games journalism after being kind of burned out on it in that I don't have the same kind of mainstream taste that still continues to dominate the industry. And this isn't me trying to sound like my taste is so refined and superior, but it's like, we are still getting a lot of like press coverage on Western produced games that feature burly dudes with guns, you know? And I'm not, you know, Mass Effect being an example, but it's also completely not like the best example of that. But the things like Call of Duty or, I don't know, I have that game like Control on my PlayStation 4. Like I was looking at my PlayStation 4 yesterday and I'm like, so many of the games that I have on here, which were the ones that were bestowed upon me because you get codes from all the big publishers are like kind of what Jeremy was saying, like sort of bro -y and really marketing a, a male demographic. And we've come a long way to recognize like women also enjoy games that are sort of pandering to a heteronormative, you know, masculine idea of, a typical gamer, but I still, I just find myself deeply bored by so many of the games that garner the majority of coverage. Um, you know, like just this continued, uh, you know, use of a lot of violence or uh, language or sexuality in these kind of sometimes gratuitous or just deeply uninteresting ways. I think gaming stories, game storytelling still has a ways to go. And I think we're not like poking at that or challenging that enough. And instead just taking a lot of games as like surface level or only judging them because, you know, against other games as opposed to sort of expanding the medium a little bit more in comparison to other media because there are so many interesting games being made especially independent games or other kinds of games that have the multiplicity of gameplay and art style and storytelling and themes. And yeah, I don't know. I just find the the predominant monoculture that persists at like a lot of the big outlets to be really, really boring. And I, you know, I'm culpable here too at an outlet that's trying to break into more games coverage. And as a result, we still cover like the more mainstream games, but it's something I find really not my speed. and. I'll shout out like Nicole, I think you do a really great job of spotlighting, you know, other games that really defy the sort of stereotype that I believe exists still that is actually legitimate with a lot of mainstream games. Um, that was kind of a ramble, but that's something I think is boring in games and I want it to be less boring. I think that one of the problems in the games industry, if you don't mind me responding, Allegra, is that games, uh, media outlets are rewarded constantly for covering the biggest games. I mean, if you wrote anything about cyberpunk last year, you're just going to get traffic and you have to make a real effort to write about smaller games, the surface smaller games. And I think that it's incumbent on publications like Polygon and like IGN to make space for that, to actively seek out that coverage and serve the audience in that way, knowing that you aren't going to get the clicks and you're not going to be blowing anything up on social media, but that you are doing your part to move the conversation forward. So I, 
I think that an effort has to be made. Like you have to push back against the the tide. And I I really hope that more publications do that. I mean, honestly, that's a big part of why I, I left the game press mainstream because I I just kind of felt like my tastes and interests, which are I, I've never been really drawn to the writing about most of the big, you know, AAA titles that was usually for someone else to do. Um, there just wasn't space for other other writing at the time. And it just, you know, it really alienated me. And uh, I was very fortunate, you know, when I started, no one was really writing about, you know, video game history or, you know, even writing stuff that took games from Japan all that seriously. And those were things that interested me. And so I kind of took an unusual route into games journalism by starting at 1UP as a graphic designer doing artwork. And then, you know, once I got my assignments for the day done, I would just write something. I would write, you know, a review of a, you know, some esoteric Game Boy Advance game that no one wanted to touch or say, well, you know, uh, it's the 10th anniversary of this game. Let's let's write a little feature about it. And eventually, you know, the, the people who ran the site, you know, said, hey, this is this is great and interesting. And I respond to this and we'd like you to do this more. So I was very fortunate that I actually got to kind of carve my niche and, and live there for you know nearly a decade and a half before management was finally just like, what is the stuff you're writing? Like, we don't care. We just wanna, you know, we wanna see the traffic. We, we, we wanna see the hits. Where's, where's that gonna come from if you're writing about like, you know, a, a Nintendo detective game for Famicom disc system that came out in 1987? Who would ever wanna talk about that? Not, you know, obviously not seeing that that game would come out from Nintendo in English five years later. But um, yeah, like I, I would really love to see more big outlets, uh, as, you know, to Allegro's point, uh, continue to push against um, obviously the, the big stuff that people want to read about. Like that should be covered, but there needs to be more space, more breathing room for the niche things. That shouldn't be just for blogs. It shouldn't just be for you know, like a, a little website that has 20 readers because no one's ever heard of it because they don't have any visibility. Like, I think there is a place for, you know, visual novels and game history and things like that to uh, to live in, in, in the mainstream. It's just a matter of giving them the chance to prove themselves and giving the people who want to pursue those topics the resources they need and the space they need to really cultivate an audience and and, you know, create this kind of recurring traffic, you know, the, this, this group of people who want to read about these things and, and know like, this is where I can go to find the, the, the really kind of weird stuff that I want to learn about. Like it, it's going to be there at, you know, big gaming site X. Um, it's just, it's, it's risky. And uh, media in general is very risk averse. It's, it's very opposed to taking chances and doing anything that's not a proven success. So, you know, it's a challenge and, and I really, laud and respect anyone who uh, can find a way to make that work and and convince the people who you know hold the purse strings that it's a good idea and that they should be allowed to do that and just to piggyback on that once again um i think that touches on another issue in the games media which is that teams are too small and so you're constantly chasing whatever is happening on a given day. You're constantly overwhelmed with what's happening. And so when you're always kind of thinking about, okay, well, I need to get this new story up about this breaking thing that's happening on Twitter right now, it's harder to get into the more interesting, more esoteric games, the more interesting, more esoteric um, interviews and that kind of thing. Like you have to really work hard to make that time and space. And I think it is incumbent upon media sites like uh, like IGN to keep growing their editorial teams so that people aren't so constantly stretched thin and can actually pursue this kind of coverage. Okay, any other, uh, any other questions from the uh, audience? Okay, um, I, I have one. This is a total fluff question, but when I was thinking about what I wanted to ask people tonight, I, this is a question I really enjoy asking people, period. Um, what What's the most objectively bad video game 
that you just genuinely enjoy and like try to pitch to other people sometimes? Jeremy, I think you're legally required to say Unlimited Saga. <laughs> I don't know if I, I really like that one that much. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's interesting, but I will, yeah, sure. The Saga series, yes. Uh, although, you know, Saga Frontier was just reissued and people are a lot more receptive to it these days than they were in 1998. So, uh, you know, I think that that speaks well to kind of the the, 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 the maturation of the audience in, in a way, like being willing to kind of put themselves out there and say, here's something weird. Uh, that was not the answer you wanted though. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I like Saga Frontier. That's a pretty fun game. <laughs> I don't think my choice is necessarily bad, but I also think it's something that mainstream, uh, kind of in the mainstream in the video game industry, people wouldn't think is necessarily a game, but it's Type Racer. Um, it's not a bad game. It's a good game. It does what it does well. It's basically a browser game where you type sentences really fast and it like moves your car along the street screen <laughs> and you race against other people to see who has the fastest typing speed. And I'm all about that game. Um, always trying to get new people to uh, create an account there to make a nice car and to race me um, because I will always win. <laughs> But it's not a bad, but like, I also, you know, will say that it's not a bad game. It does what it does very well. I'm constantly embarrassed by the amount of time that I put into FIFA, which is a <laughs> consistently awful video game that only gets worse whenever it comes out. And I actually have huge ethical problems with its uh, monetization. Sorry to make this like more serious. Um, <laughs> and yet every year I put like 200 hours into it because oh EA God. is really good at making that game insanely addictive. So, um, come September, October, like I'll probably be right back at it again. And I'll be like thinking heavily about my life choices. It's <laughs> amazing. I keep looking over at my shelf where I have my games because I'm trying to think if any of them are bad, but my taste Allegra's is so tastes good. are pure and good. <laughs> yeah, my taste is so perfect. Um, I will say the one game that was critically reviled that I still hold near and dear is um, Pokemon Channel on the GameCube. <laughs> which I sadly don't even, I was looking, I don't have it anymore. I don't know where it is, but it's a game where, I mean, I'm a big Pokemon nerd. So I think all Pokemon games are, I mean, not objectively good, but like subjectively perfect um, because it's Pokemon. And Pokemon Channel is one where like you literally just watch TV in the game with Pikachu. And it's like one of the least interactive games I've ever played because you literally are watching TV and like, there's a shopping channel and a weather channel and a little channel that just shows an anime. And yeah, you're just watching. Sometimes you're watching Pikachu watch the TV or sometimes you are watching <laughs> the TV. And as someone who loves both Pokemon and watching TV, I mean, it was a perfect combination <laughs> for me, but very hard sell to reviewers who generally panned it and very hard sell to other people who I don't think really bought it because it was very dumb, but has a great soundtrack and very cute Pokemon in it. So I am a big fan and I wish I still had my copy. I've never heard of that. And I'm very excited. To First know, Gen came now. out on the Nintendo 64, I think. It was on the GameCube. It GameCube. was kind of like a yeah. sequel to Hey You Pikachu, which was also yes, stupid, there you go. but good. Yes. Yeah, that was on N64 and you used a microphone to talk to Pikachu and it didn't really work and it was incredibly <laughs> annoying. This one, they gave up the conceit. It's like Pikachu was not interacting with you. He's watching TV. You either watch TV with him or you're not playing. So, If, if you want to see the evolution of the games industry, the, the tipping point was when Pokemon became a legitimate beat within the games industry. Because if you pitched anything be Pokemon related before 2014, you'd probably get laughed out of the room. 
why people are like, oh, Pokemon's for babies, but now it's very serious business. So that's uh, if that's that's how you know that the evo- the games industry has changed. <laughs> I do think that's why I honestly, and this sounds dumb, but I think that's honestly why I found success in this industry. Like, I started in September 2015. Pokemon mm-hmm. Go came out July 2016. There you go. Mm-hmm. And I literally have an award from Chartbeat, which is like the main, like a big analytics company that charts like how much traffic different websites are generating. So Vox Media used to use it, New York Times uses it. So it basically catalogs like the most read uh, articles on the internet. Like, and every year it does a big, like here's the biggest articles from that year. I won an award from Chartbeat for writing about Pokemon Go. So I have that like framed in my house, well done. in my apartment. Because it, it was huge. Like it literally yeah. was like everything. And so that sort of, you know, splintered out into like a general interest into Pokemon beyond Pokemon Go. But yeah, I don't I don't think I would be as successful in this career if uh, Pokemon were not reabsorbed by the mainstream, I will say. Um, Matt, did you have another question or did you, is your hand just up from before? I think, I think it just stayed up. Okay. Um, I mean, I could ask another question. So. Yeah, go for it. We're, we're getting near the end, but if you got another one, that's, that's yeah. fine. I, I guess I'd like what, what the relationship between games journalists and game companies is, is like, and also how that's changed over the past year, you know, no in-person events and, and so on. Um, and it's kind of that, the kind of mechanics of that. Um, I think that it can vary heavily. Uh, there are times where it's contentious at best because game companies often see uh, journalists as kind of troublemakers who at best are there to help out with the marketing campaign and at worst are just kind of trashing everything that all their carefully laid plans and a lot of game companies see journalists kind of as a tool and their ultimate goal is how can I manipulate journalists to get to the point where I can get the right score on Metacritic and I can get the right coverage and I can get them to echo the right talking points. And they spend a lot of time thinking about that. And it's really interesting because often I'll talk to them and they're like, journalism is such a black box. I don't really understand it. I'm like, I don't think it's that hard to understand, but if you're saying so, now, that's not to say that I don't have good relationships with people um, in on the industry side, but I have experienced in the past that there is a lot of uh, bitterness toward people in the games media a lot of the time. So I can't really speak to the way things are now. Um you know, because I'm more on the other side at this point. But I will say that leaving the games press was very illuminating because that was the point at which I got to see which, you know, PR people and companies that I worked with actually just liked working with me and respected me and which were like, well, you know, he represents a, you know, this much traffic and we can, should get in good and you know, maintain that traffic and, you know, get, get favor there. Um, there were a few companies, you know, that I still have, you know, they're, I'm still on their press list. I still get press mailings and game codes from uh, one or two big companies and still, you know, got developer access, uh, even though I was basically like blogging at that point. Um, so, you know, I, I appreciate those companies and, uh, you know, the people who, who work there um, because I feel like, you know, they are much more authentic than a lot of the, the the PR people that you end up working with in the press. And it could be a different situation, you know, a few years later, but um, certainly like that was my kind of come to Jesus moment where I found out who my real friends were, you know, the people, not even friends, just like the people who really valued what I did in my time in the press. And it was good to know that there were a few, you know, people who were like basically you did great stuff. You know, we really liked your work. Your grandfather did, you know, we'll always, you know, be willing to find uh, an opportunity for you to talk to developers if at all possible, or to, you know, get access to something that you need. So um, yeah, it's, it's nice to know that it's not all just, uh, 
fake smiles and uh, empty promises that there are, you know, there is some genuine, I think, humanity out there on the, the publisher journalism relations side. I was going to say that I don't really know if I do have relationships with um, at least like companies. Um, I don't do a ton of work that relies on that sort of like big name access. Um, and I also have never been to an event like E3. So I have never done that sort of in-person um, in sort of like networking. So um, yeah, I think that's a unique experience because I was going to go to E3 this year as my first full-time job. Um, I mean, last year and the pandemic happened. So I've never been to those um, events. I do email with PR people, you know, to um, set up interviews, but, uh, but yeah, um, someone else handles codes and stuff for us. So like, I don't really, have any sort of you know I guess it's kind of like a very um it's a very email based relationship uh and that's how kind of just me asking PR people for things and questions and and going from there or ideally working directly with developers talking to them directly is always I think kind of the ideal thing so when I say I don't have relationships um with companies I would say it's like you know I don't have, I'm, I'm not doing thing, I'm not doing the kind of work where I need to get access to big names at those companies to get interviews or whatever. That's just not what I do. I lost my train of thought originally. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I think there's a couple things. So one thing that I learned while I was at Polygon was that cultivating those relationships can be really difficult, but also I found them to be really, at, at that time, at least when I was at Polygon, really necessary in a lot of ways to advance. So I was lucky to be in New York. So I was in an office setting and also New York is a pretty big place for games, um, you know, relatively like for the East Coast at least. So I did have more access than a lot of my remote coworkers who weren't able to actually have interviews with people like in person. That was something I was able to do or like even going to game preview events. Um, I had a lot of opportunities to actually meet people like in person, even if it's just a PR person, it makes it a lot easier to cultivate that relationship than going forward over email or you get their phone number or, you start seeing them again and again at events. And those are the people I still am able to reach out to, even though now I'm two jobs later, I'm at Slate now and I can still reach out to my Nintendo guy and be like, hey, how's it going? What are you up to? Like, let's chat, can I get this game? Um, because they know me and I've been doing this for a while. And I, not only was I like in a place where I could go to these events a lot, but also I did get to go to E3 and GDC. I remember feeling sad, Nicole. I remember you were supposed to go and then the pandemic happened and it's like all thing. Actually, I, we we met at PAX and that was like the week before lockdown. And that was yes. like the, the last big like event that anyone got to go to mm -hmm. PAX East. Um, but things like that, I, I do feel like are really important. And I felt like, okay, this is also why I'm progressing like even past some of my peers who'd been there longer, who lived in more remote or obscure places and didn't get to go to those events quite as much. And I do think it's completely possible to succeed without having those connections, like incredibly so, because there are so many people who work in different places all across the country and so much of it is virtual, especially now. But another thing I found just like as a journalist is that when I say advancing, I even mean like interpersonally, like institutionally, because <laughs> I'm trying to phrase this appropriately. Um, a lot of the gaming industry is quite small for media. Um, so you start to see the same people at events and you start to get to know each other very well. And I mean, a lot of it is like a lot of people 
have very similar interests and become quite close even beyond their own, um, you know, beyond the professional. Like I, a lot of my best friends in my life are people I've met through games. Um, and that's really great, but I also feel like that can sometimes be a, a greater benefit than one would hope it would be in terms of like even advancing in your career. I think that's just true of media in general. Like a lot of it is nepotism and who you like and who you know. And I did find that to be true in games. Like I did find I was being pushed to like go to that party and meet this person. And I don't like parties and I don't like meeting people. So I really hated that. And I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to write about the internet where everyone just talks on instant message all day. So I didn't want to do that anymore. Yes, I am also very shy. Mm -hmm. So GDC was also very, GDC and E3 were very terrifying, but exciting prospects. It's really fun to meet like developers in person. And it's fun to see Shigeru Miyamoto at the Nintendo booth, things like that. But then it's like, after you leave the show floor and you're supposed to go to, or even meeting people, the press room is awesome. I've met Kat and Jeremy in the press rooms and exactly what Jeremy was saying about being the guy with his head down working. That was exactly <laughs> what you were doing. And it's great. I love that. But then it's the after part where you have to, like, it's, that's just media. I think it's important to recognize like, Games journalism is still part of journalism and part of media. And there are these other like social factors that I don't think people recognize are, are there um, that can be frustrating if you are a shy person or just a person who doesn't like to have to contrive relationships with people. I think a lot of people in the press also don't realize just how much developers and publishers know about you if you work at a notable outlet. I think it was a really illuminating moment for me. One time at E3, I was in a developer interview, you know, um, and there was there were PR handlers there and one was sitting next to me and they carry around, you know, these binders and booklets and things like that. And I just happened to glance over and I noticed that the page that it was exposed was basically like part of a profile about me, like listing my favorite games and things like that, stuff was highlighted. I was like, okay, like I get it, you know, like they, they need to know kind of how to massage the message and uh, what to hit on and so on and so forth. But it was still just kind of like a, you know, like what does the FBI know about me kind of moment? Like, you know, I'm not just like some dude who's off writing about stuff. And then sometimes I get an invitation to go talk to, you know, a game developer, like they're tracking what I do and they're paying attention and they're saying, you know, like, we got to keep an eye on this person. We got to, you know, kind of build a profile on them. And they do that for everyone. It's got to be exhausting, but it's also, you know, it, it, it's a mistake to think like these people are necessarily your friends. It's good to kind of have that, that sense of distance and that sense of like, this is a transactional relationship, you know, most of these are. Um, and I think um, that was especially hard for people to keep keep kind of in mind in, in the, the days when I was first starting out where there was more money being thrown around. There were more of these big events, just like, you know, places to go, like companies would fly you out in a helicopter to, you know, do target shooting or something to promote Call of Duty or fly you to Hawaii or whatever. Um, and, you know, ultimately that was them doing that for their own benefit. They had a marketing budget and, you know, that was how they spent it was to fet the journalists and try to get good press coverage, maybe get a magazine cover or a cover story, you know, on a website or something. Um, and it's very easy to kind of be lulled into that sense of like, wow, I'm important. No, you're just, you're just someone who is plugged into a lot of video, like visual traffic, you know, a, a lot of eyeballs. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's I, I think a, a challenge for journalists to kind of navigate that and not get suckered in and like feel like, oh, uh, I've got so many friends in the industry when, when really you have some friends, but you have a lot of people who are just like, They've got eyeballs. This person is important until they're not. Okay. Well, it's it's uh, we've gone over an hour, so I, I'll, uh, I'll 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 let you all go. But is there um is there anything that you would like to leave with? Any kind of final statements about the game journalism industry or? you know, people might be considering going into game journalism, anything like that. If 
you want to go into the games journalism, I wish you the best of luck because it's a very small industry and there aren't many jobs out there and it doesn't pay very well. Um, so that's the negative part. The positive part is that I've worked with a lot of amazing and talented people and it is pretty neat to be able to play video games and talk about video games and write about an industry that I actually do care about um, quite a bit. And the thing that I've noticed over the past you know, 10 years is that a lot of people really, really want to evolve how we talk about video games. Whereas maybe 10 years ago it was much more marketing oriented or more hobbyist oriented, I guess you could say. Uh, so I think we're trending in the right direction. Uh, progress isn't always linear, but uh, I will end on a positive note and say that I'm hopeful that things can continue to get better as newsrooms become more, di more diverse, they unionize, and hopefully pay gets better and such. Yes, to that. And also, um, I think the most important thing that I learned um, when I was first starting as a freelance writer is what is a pitch and what is a good pitch. Um, there's a lot of information online, not all of it's good, but like finding a way to learn how to succinctly tell an editor what story you want to write, why it's important and why you should be the person to write it is like what changed everything for me. Um, you know, still got a ton of rejections, but like a lot more people said yes once I learned like, okay, this is what an editor, you, and, and it changes and, and to know that what an editor wants changes depending on the publication and the editor that you are, uh, you are pitching. So if you did want to, if you do want to do a career in journalism, in freelancing, or you want to start with freelancing, um, spending time uh, doing that research is like chef's kiss. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, Jeremy. Um, yeah, I think I totally want to second what Nicole just said. Um, I think that's really important and something I feel really strongly about as well of like learning how to pitch a story, but also yourself. Um, I think understanding your own strengths as a writer, as an expert and cultivating the confidence to promote yourself um, as such, as a person with those strengths is really crucial in succeeding in, I mean, honestly, probably any industry. Um, and also I would say to remember that games journalism is, it's still journalism. It's just a subgenre of journalism. It's a type of journalism that you're specializing in. But the general tenets of journalism as a medium and a practice are still applicable and really important for you to learn and understand. And I would really encourage anyone who wants to pursue writing about video games in particular to learn about the history of journalism, to read really varied writing from all kinds of outlets and publications and writers on different kinds of topics and broaden your horizons outside of just video games to really understand what a good article looks like in all different kinds of fashions. Because I think some people just think games journalism is writing about games, but it's journalism and the topic is video games, just as there's music journalism and political journalism. Um, so just, you know, doing your homework is really important. I think it says a lot about the, the, the current trajectory of games journalism that this panel, if you had put together a panel when I first started in the press in 2003, it would not have been three women and one man. <laughs> you might have been able to find three women in the games press making a living doing that if you looked really hard but it's just become a much more diverse and open space. And, you know, all of us have or currently 
work for basically the biggest publications out there. And yeah, that's fantastic. But at the same time, you don't have to work for a large publication, you know, for an IGN or a Slate or a Polygon to be part of the games press. You know, if you if you're really interested in this and really feel like you have something to say, there are so many avenues for you to get your voice out there these days, uh, whether it's YouTube or just social media or, you know, blogs are still a thing. People still read them. There, there are so many ways, so many avenues to express yourself. And even though I'm not, you know, professionally in the games press anymore, the work that I do with podcasts and videos, you know, covering video game history, I still have that same approach of wanting to bring something new and interesting, like to the viewer or the listener. And I do just as much research and talk to just as many developers almost as I did uh, back when I was in the press. It's just, you know, much more uh, granular, much more focused. And I think that's a great way to maybe not make a full career of doing this, uh, but definitely if that's something you aspire to, to get a start that way, but just to, you know, kind of find your own place and, and say, this is, this is something I can bring that no one else can, or that I can bring in a way that no one else can. And, you know, stake out that territory and just do the best work that you can. And I, I think, you know, even if you, start small and don't work for a big publication. If you prove yourself, you know, when you reach out to, to PR, to contacts for game publishers, they can look at your work and they will. And it may not have huge traffic numbers, but they will, you know, the good companies will still say like this person, like they're bringing something of value up there and that'll get you onto press lists and that opens up all kinds of doors. So, you know, don't think that you have to, go out there and apply for jobs. And if you don't get something at, you know, IGN right away, then you're doomed. It, th that's not the case at all. Uh, it just means that you have the opportunity to kind of go your own way and, you know, express yourself in, in you know, and, and the knowledge that you have, the, the perspectives that you have. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a very democratic place uh, business now. So you know, for anyone who's aspiring to do that, uh, I wish you luck. And I think there are great opportunities out there, even if you have to make them yourself. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. I, this was a lot of fun. This was, this was really great. I, I think um, there were some really, really interesting things brought up uh, tonight. Um, yeah, we'll have, to, we'll have to do this again at some point. So thank you all for coming. And uh, all of you attendees, thank you for coming as well. Uh, and I'm going to turn off the recording. <laughs>